The Second Boer War of Independence of 1899 to 902 was marked by miscalculations on the part of both British military and their political leaders. In their efforts to subdue the Boers who were fighting for their independence, the British army underestimated the ability and courage of the Boers. Unable to bring the war to a conclusion through traditional fighting, the British military, and in particular Lord Roberts and Lord Kishner, instituting a scorched earth policy combined with a concentration camp policy. This took place in the Transvaal and Orange Free State in South Africa. On the 13th of March 1900, Lord Roberts, chief commander of the British forces, issued a proclamation inviting the Boers to lay down their arms, surrender and sign an oath of neutrality. They would then be free to return to their homes on the agreement that they would no longer participate in the war. About 20,000 Boers eventually made use of this offer. They were called the Protected Citizens. Roberts had established two concentration camps for the refugees of the protected families. Roberts had thought this would end the war, but by June 1900, it seemed the rest of the Boers were still fighting for their independence. The Boers had then started a guerrilla war, which included attacks on the railway lines. Roberts then issued a warning that for every attack on a railway line, the closest homestead would be burnt down. When this didn't work, another warning was given by Roberts in the September that all homesteads in a 16 kilometer radius of any attack would be burned down, with all livestock and crops destroyed. By this time, about 30,000 Boer homes were gone. Lord Kishner took over from Roberts as commander in November 1900. The scorched earth policy was then intensified and homesteads were burned to the ground, even if no attack occurred. But the scorched earth policy had led to more and more Boer women and children being left homeless. It was decided to bring them into the camps as well. The difference though is that these families who did not sign an oath of neutrality were taken against their will. Around 200,000 people were forcibly put on open railway trucks and taken to the camps. These were called the undesirables, which meant families of Boers who were still fighting in the war or families of prisoners of war. Rations were used as a weapon and withheld from those families whose husbands and fathers were still fighting. These families eventually outnumbered the protected citizens and their families of more than double. The camps unfortunately ceased to be refugee camps and became concentration camps. Studies of the British camps often evoke emotions of anger, denial and sorrow. Early descriptions of the camps are at opposite ends of the spectrum, ranging from beneficial refugee camps complete with hospitals and schools, to death camps aimed at genocide of the Boer families. It is because of a British lady, Emily Hobhouse, that the conditions of these camps were released and created a public outcry in Britain. Emily Hobhouse was a British welfare and humanitarian activist who visited the camps in South Africa. She stated that the camp system is a wholesale cruelty. To keep these camps going is murder to the children. The tents were small and overcrowded in stifling heat. Emily Hobhouse writes, Soap has been unobtainable. When she requested soap for the people, she was told that soap was a luxury. She said they went to sleep without any provisions having been made for them and without anything to eat or drink. I saw crowds of them along railway lines in bitterly cold weather, in pouring rain, hungry, sick, dying and dead. The water supply was inadequate, no bedstead or mattress is supplied. The rations were extremely small and when the actual quantity was given out, it fell short of the amount prescribed. The detainees received no fruit or vegetables, not even milk for the babies. The meat and flour issued were crawling with maggots. Emily Hobhouse writes, I have in my possession coffee and sugar which were described as follows by a London analyst. In the case of the first 66% imitation, and in the case of the second were sweepings from a warehouse. A camp commander made the following statement quoted by Emily Hobhouse. The wardens were under orders not to interfere with the inmates, unless they should try to escape. Dr. Kendall Franks reports on the Irene concentration camp. In one of these tents there were three families, parents and children, a total of 14 to 20 people and all were suffering from the measles. In her book, Medibura and Default, Sarah Roll, who was taken and kept at Spiankorp concentration camp, states, There were poisonous sulfate of copper, grounded glass, fish hooks and razor blades in the rations. 
Emily Hobhouse spoke of Lizzie van Sale, the seven-year-old daughter of a Boer combatant who was still fighting in the war. According to Hobhouse, due to this, the girl was treated harshly and placed on the lowest rations. She was moved to a new hospital about 50 kilometers away from the concentration camp, suffering from starvation. Unable to speak English, she was labelled an idiot by the hospital staff who were unable to understand her. When an Afrikaans woman went over to comfort her after she was crying for her mother, she was told not to interfere with the child as she was a nuisance. Lizzie died later at the Bloemfontein camp from typhoid fever, which was witnessed by Hobhouse. According to a British journalist, W.T. Steed, the concentration camps were nothing more than a cruel torture machine. He writes, Every one of these children who died as a result of the halving of their rations, thereby exerting pressure onto their families still in the battlefield, was purposefully murdered. The system of half rations stands exposed and stark and unshamefully as a cold-blooded deed of state policy employed with the purpose of ensuring the surrender of people whom we were not able to defeat on the battlefield. When Hobhouse returned to England in May 1901 with a report, she received scathing criticism and hostility from the British government and many of the media. When Emily Hobhouse wanted the photograph of Lizzie to be published in Britain, it was refused. The matter was then taken to Parliament. St John Broderick, the Secretary of State of War, defended the government's policy by arguing that the camps were purely voluntary and that the interned bourges were content and comfortable and that it was just simply military necessary. In June 1901, Emily Hobhouse published a 15-page pamphlet reporting on the horrific state of the concentration camps. Lloyd George openly accused the government of a policy of extermination directed against the Boer population. In June 1901, Liberal Party leader Henry Campbell Bannerman took up the assault and answered the rhetorical question, When is war not a war? When it is carried on by methods of barbarism in South Africa, referring to those same camps and the policies that created them. Concerned by the escalating public outcry, the government called on Kishner for a detailed report and by August 1901 statistics were being returned. Boers and Africans were reported to be in camps of refuge and the crisis was becoming a catastrophe as the death rates appeared very high, especially amongst the children due to measles and typhoid outbreaks. The government eventually agreed to send the Fawcett Commission to investigate in August 1901. While it is probable that the British government expected the commission to produce a report that could be used to fend off the criticism, in the end it confirmed everything that Emily Hobhouse had said of the shocking conditions in her report. Hobhouse returned to South Africa in October 1901 but was not permitted to land and was eventually deported five days after arriving with no reason being given. The civil authority took over the running of the camps from Kishna and the British command and by February 1902 the annual death rate in the concentration camps for white inmates dropped to 6.9% and eventually to 2%. However, by then the damage had already been done. Improvements were however much slower in coming to the African camps. It is thought that about 12% of African inmates died, but the precise number of deaths of Africans in concentration camps is unknown, as little attempt was made to keep any records of the 107 Africans who were interned. The photograph of Lizzie was then published to the Times on the 5th of March 1902, using the photograph as propaganda to support the false notions that the Boer children were being neglected by their parents. They stated that this photograph was taken of Lizzie when she first entered the camp and that Lizzie's mother was prosecuted for mistreatment. Hobhouse was unable to find any evidence of the prosecution against Lizzie's mother for neglect. She also located the photographer who captured this image of Lizzie. He stated that the photograph was taken two months after Lizzie had arrived at the camp. The article in the Times were all propaganda lies. According to historians, the treatment and neglect was inhumane. Far more people died in the camps than in combat. The conditions of the camps were appalling. Food was of very poor quality, bad sanitation with overcrowded tents, and medical assistance was poor. The camps were ill-equipped to handle large numbers of people and little was known at the time about how to handle epidemics of measles and typhoid. Thousands died. A total of 28,000 civilian Boer families died in these camps. 80% of these deaths were children. 
Less notice was taken of British camps for the African people, who had even more squalid living conditions. A total of 66 African concentration camps were set up across the Transvaal and the Free State, where conditions were just as bad and the death rates similar. The African men, not already fighting alongside the Boers in the war, were used as forced labour on the British gold mines and building of railways. The British did not bother to keep records for the native Africans housed in the camps, but it is believed that their death toll was similar to that of the Boers. Most of the nurses and matrons in the camps had nothing but good intentions. They did their best to help the captives stay healthy and safe. But with there being only one doctor or nurse in each camp, with too few resources and space to do it, the people under their care died at such alarming rates that the camps nearly exterminated an entire youth generation. As a direct result of the concentration camps, the Peace Treaty of Vereniging was signed according to which the Boer Republics came under British rule. An English school textbook printed in England and published in Johannesburg in 1914, Historical Geography South Africa by J. R. Fisher, makes the following claim. During the later stages of the war, the relations women and children of the Boers still in the field were fed and cared for at the expense of Great Britain, a method of procedure which, although humane, postponed the end of the war at the expense of many valuable lives and much money.